what we do here is go back, 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 back. Hi, and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History. This is Chapter 20, Worlds Apart, the Americas and Oceania. This chapter presents the evolution of complex societies in the Americas and the Pacific Islands up through the 16th century. Isolation and varied resources led to a wide range of social structures, from simple hunting and gathering to settled agricultural villages, to the highly complex urban societies like those of the Aztecs and the Incas. Common aspects of these societies include the following. First, they were isolated from one another and from the cultures of the Eastern Hemisphere. Second, metallurgical technologies were not developed, although the peoples of Mesoamerica and South America mined gold and silver. Third, there were few domesticated animals, the llama and the alpaca of the Andes Mountains being the notable exceptions, and, as a result, no wheeled transport. And finally, they lacked a written language. The Aztecs had mathematics, precise calendars, and a symbolic system of record keeping, but no formal written literature. The Incas kept accounts with quipu, a system of knotted cord. Study of these societies is limited by the lack of written sources. The earliest accounts of the Aztec and Inca come from the Spanish conquerors and missionaries and are distorted by their prejudices. Nevertheless, these accounts, plus oral traditions and archaeological evidence, make it possible to describe the societies in some details. All right, so first up, we have the states and empires in Mesoamerica and North America. Societies had limited and no contact with Africa, Asia, and Europe. This is before a time which we're going to study very soon called the Columbian Exchange. Christopher Columbus sails the ocean in 1492, and after his discovery of the New World, he then uh, discovers that there's a whole different set of animals and plants and uh, just different stuff all on the Western Hemisphere that's separate from the Eastern Hemisphere. The last time these two groups of people, being from the Western and Eastern Hemisphere, had interacted with another, one another was back when we still had the land bridges that were uh, used by our way, 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 way back in Chapter 1 ancestors that had walked across from probably northeastern uh, Russia all the way over to the northwestern states of Alaska in the United States. They then would spread out and uh, disperse southward across the uh, American continent of North and South America, and that became the uh, Mesoamerican peoples that we're going to talk about now. Because of this, uh, there wasn't really a lot of similar things that we had seen in Europe. As we look at Europe and Asia and the Eastern Hemisphere, we start to notice there's some patterns. There's metallurgy, there's certain types of religious systems that spread, there are ideals and art and architecture. All those things kind of diffuse from either Europe or Asia or Africa, depending on what we're talking about outward, along the trade routes such as the Silk Road or Indian Ocean trade. Because of this, uh, there isn't a lot of uh, records that we have, especially because there wasn't written records in the uh, Western Hemisphere from the Mesoamericans. Some of what we have, you'll see a little bit later, is more pictorial, almost like drawings, kind of like hieroglyphics in a, si in a kind of way of uh, describing their calendar systems and their um, religious systems. But in reality, there, we don't have a ton of, of records up until really the Spanish conquistadors and the other Europeans show up and start to write down and transcribe some of the information. That being the case, however, there are some exceptions. There was a brief presence of Scandinavians in Newfoundland, Canada. We have some archaeological evidence that they got on big boats. Some of those uh, northerners from northern Europe got on boats and kind of went all the way over to basically what we would call Canada today, wandered around for a bit, and then like left. We're not 100% sure why they left. Maybe they were a raiding party that just kind of decided there wasn't much here, so they left. Or they just kind of slowly realized they weren't going to work out a settlement here so far away from their homeland, so they went home. But um, there was some brief presence of those Scandinavians. Some Asian contract contact with Australia, which we'll talk about later, as um, some of the like peoples in the South Pacific actually uh, got on boats as well and migrated by doing some sort of uh, island to island kind of uh, sailing. And the Mesoamerican period, Mesoamerica in period of war and conquest, it, that's what it really is dealing with all the way until the 8th century. Here's a map of uh, some of the empires we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the, uh, the Aztec Empire really here and some of the Toltec and a little bit of where the Maya Empire was before. Uh, there's the Toltec and Aztec empires between the years 950 to 1520 CE. There's a close-up view of Tio Tenochtitlan. We'll actually have a little audio clip in a minute to kind of help us uh, figure out how to say that. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much right around uh, a lake, and the Aztecs were really good uh, as being able to interact with uh, their environment in a way that allowed them to farm and create a pretty large empire in that area. 
First up, we have the Toltecs, the regional states in central Mexican Valley. Uh, they had religious and cultural influence of the collapsed Tino Tinotishlan, uh, and there was intense warfare. This, these pictures on the right show some uh, statues of their warriors that they had carved uh, during their time uh, of civilization. The Toltecs migrate from northwest Mexico and settle at Tula, which is near modern Mexico City, kind of in the center of modern-day Mexico. Urban population in the cities was probably 60,000. Uh, another 60,000 was in the surrounding uh, rural areas. They had subjugation of surrounding peoples nearby, and their civilization was destroyed by internal strife and nomadic incursions uh, around 1175 CE. So they kind of pop up on our radar and disappear fairly quickly. Next, we get to another group called the Mexica, one of several groups of migrants in the mid-13th century CE. They had a tradition of kidnapping women, seizing cultivated lands. Uh, they settled in around 1345 CE in Mexico Tenochtitlan which later will become Mexico City. The way they were able to uh, solve the problem of being able to create a large amount of agriculture for their peoples was that they used a very specific type of uh, agricultural technique, which you probably should kind of put a little star, ball, star by, which is called chinapas, which is dredging soil from the lake bottom to create fertile plots of land. Now, if you think about how a lake works, a lake is a large body of water that is trapped in land, and it doesn't really get a lot of... Um, change in the way that the the bottom of the lake is structured except for when like leaves land on the lake and they kind of rot they disintegrate and their their particles go down to the bottom trees might fall into the lake dirt will fall into the lake animals might die and like their bodies will end up in the lake specifically fish end up dead in the bot and they float to the bottom and as those things decompose just like manure or just like um composting as we do today those minerals and nutrients become kind of this this like really highly rich nutrient filled mush that's at the bottom of the lake now the mexico were really smart in that they were able to figure out that if they took some of that dirt and they were to use it for their farming the the nutrients that are saved down in the bottom of that uh, that muck really actually allows the plants to grow better because in the same way we talked about manure and compost composting it really creates um, fertile plots of land i was able to uh, look on youtube for some creative commons kind of uh, stuff and i found this little video that maybe will help us understand a little bit about how their chinapas actually worked the key to the proper functioning of the chinampas was water management the canals of the Chinampas enable drainage of the spongy wetland soil during the rainy season and thus reclamation of the land. During the dry season, water could infiltrate each Chinampa from the canals and the porous Chinampa soil received a continuous supply of water. Irrigation was needed only during periods of drought. With this abundant and self-regulating supply of water and rich soil, the Chinampa zone was a self-sufficient economy until well into the 20th century. An average family land holding of one half an acre provided a multitude of crops, building materials, animal products, fish and waterfowl, with ample surplus for market. Chinampas were constructed in two ways. In marshy areas, ditches were dug around rectangular pieces of land, piling the mud on top to create the chinampas. In shallow lakes, the building of a chinampa required seven steps. First, using a long pole, a suitable base for a chinampa was located in shallow water. Wherever possible, the remains of an old chinampa, called a cimiento, were used. Second, strong reeds were stuck in the bottom, marking the dimensions of the base. Most chinampas were about 300 feet long and 30 feet wide. Third, mud was dug from around it and piled on top of the reeds and the cimiento. Fourth, mats of water vegetation were cut and towed to the new chinampa. Fifth, a compost heap was created by layering the mats of vegetation on top of each other until there was a thick cap of vegetation. Sixth, mud from the bottom of the lake was mixed with soil from an old chinampa and placed on top reaching a height of about one foot above the water level. A porous base, rich in organic matter, was thus created through which water easily flowed. Lastly, the sides were secured with woven reeds, and then willow trees, Salix pomplandiana, were planted around the edges. Willows planted hundreds of years ago can still be seen in the Chinampa zone that survives today, on the southern edge of Mexico City. 
The willow roots grow very fast and deep, so they don't compete with crops for soil nutrients, nor interfere with cultivation. And because they have a very narrow shape, they don't shade crops either. But they do provide protection from frost and wind, as well as nesting sites for birds and other pest predators. In addition, the willows are the community's major source of construction materials and firewood. Yeah, so that's my fun little uh, Creative Commons available, uh, super pixelated video on how Chinapas work. Uh, next up, we have the Aztec Empire. The Mexica develop a tributary relationship uh, with the surrounding empire, uh, peoples by the 15th century. Now remember, tributary means that the people who are uh, nearby basically provide a uh, tax system for the main empire within its uh, borders or nearby. So for example, if you live in a small village nearby uh, the Aztec Empire, once a year there would be uh, heralds or some sort of person to come by, collect the taxes based on however much land or however much people or whatever the, the kind of system they had set up, and you would pay a percentage in taxes to that empire in exchange. They would protect you and also not come and burn down your village. So uh, this was kind of a nice situation for the Aztecs during this time, but it also helped to support the uh, larger area as a whole. Uh, there are some leaders we need to kind of know. Is it a quarrel? Uh, between 1428 to 1440, and Montezuma, or Montezuma the first, he lives from 1440 to 1469, or rules from 1440 to 1469, and uh, the Aztec Empire is known for a few things. One of them is, which is this stone calendar that's on the left-hand side that uh, was fairly accurate for being one that really didn't have access to the literature of the Eastern Hemisphere in terms of observing the planets or the stars. Uh, they joined with uh, Texcoco, and Talcopan to create the Aztec Empire during this time. Now here's Mexico society. There was a hierarchical social structure, high stature for soldiers. As a uh, pictured here on the right, we have a picture of a commoner or a no or a normal person working their way up in the hierarchy of warrior classes. And so, if you start at the top left, you can see a man in a boat, and you see him just doing his normal stuff. And as he's able to progress, it kind of gives instructions on how uh, being a valuable warrior and being successful, you would be given different types of. Um, uh, adornment or some sort of uh, valuable things that you could wear that distinguished you as part of a different class of people than you were previously. Uh, mainly these soldiers were drawn, drawn from the uh, aristocratic class. There were land grants given as a result of successfully being a soldier or being a very valuable soldier. There were food privileges, often more food. There were sumptuary privileges, which really is that whole um, being able to wear a certain type of clothing as a uh, is a part of your class of people you were, you were, and there was also personal adornment. So to give you kind of an example of what this looks like a little bit, we've talked a little bit before about the Etruscans in the past, and I've talked to you about the royal purple. It was made from uh, crushing up hundreds of little seashells to get this very deep purple, and it was very uh, unique in that uh, as you kind of dyed cloth with this purple, the more that you uh, had the cloth, and the, or the longer you had the cloth and the more it was in the sun, the more uh, brightly colored it would become. There's also a similar uh, thing in the sumptuary privileges in other cultures, specifically Korean. With the Etruscans, you could only wear the purple if you were a noble. With the Korean wansom, you have uh, different colors that denote specific uh, titles within the royal family, like there was yellow for the uh, empress, as she was the only one allowed to wear that. And then a more uh, European example, we have Queen Elizabeth I and having uh, the ability to wear only certain types of furs as part of the noble class. And in all these cultures, if you were caught wearing something you weren't supposed to be wearing for your class, there would be different number of um, punishments resulting from that. One could be uh, fines and oftentimes public humiliation, but it could even lead up to death because you would be impersonating someone who you're not, and that could cause lots of havoc within a society. Next, we have Mexico women. As, of course, we've talked about before, there is pretty much a patriarchal structure for their society. There was an emphasis on childbearing. Specifically, uh, for the idea of uh, breeding future soldiers to protect the society. Uh, the mothers of warriors were especially praised for their ability to provide uh, warriors to the society. And again, here's another little picture thing where they talk about the difference between boys and girls. On the left-hand side, you have a young boy being born or being uh, uh, accepted into uh, the society. There's like a fire smoke ritual, it looks like. 
And then on the right-hand side, you can see some more common tasks that we associate with uh, women, such as a mother kind of instructing her on how to either clean with a broom or to plant. Uh, you see on the third uh, picture that the mother is instructing the daughter on how to uh, kind of prepare food as there's like a vase with water and some sort of like bread or cake that she's making. And then finally, in the final picture, you have the mother instructing uh, the daughter or young woman on how to uh, weave cloth or to create uh, textiles. Uh, using a uh, rudimentary loom. Priests in the Mexican society, masters of complex agricultural ritual calendars. They had to be well-versed because there wasn't a written language. So these priests were very integral into understanding when there was going to be a celestial event, when there was going to be a, um, a celebration, what days the gods need to be placated on with sacrifices, and this all had to be done through basically a series of pictures and, and speech, spoken word, and this couldn't be really passed along without any, um, with, without any writing. And they provided ritual functions, specifically uh, sacrifices, they were able to read omens, they advised the rulers, as we've seen before in other cultures, and occasionally became rulers themselves, depending on the situations. There were cultivators and slaves. The communal groups were called kaupuli. Originally, they're kin-based or family-relationally based. They had management of communal lands that they shared collectively. There was a work obligation on aristocratic lands, meaning that uh, the people would be forced every so often to uh, go and work on those aristocratic lands for farming purposes as being part of their social class. So, if, for example, let's say you were a uh, farmer living in a small village nearby. Well, maybe once a year you would have to go for like a couple like weeks off to an aristocrat's land and you would have to help them farm and that would pay part of your uh, social responsibility. Think of it kind of like a, ta a work tax for uh, the ability to be protected by the aristocrats or be part of that society as a whole. There was a slave class. Uh, mostly we know it as debtors, people who owed debts to one another. They worked as slaves, and children were often sold into slavery as they were seen as not really a burden, but an, a set of hands that could be let, rented out as a part of the family, and then eventually they would be returned to the family. The Mexican religion, influenced by indigenous traditions from the Olmec period, they did play that ritual ball game we've talked about before. Uh, there was a solar calendar, 365 days, which is insanely accurate for a group of people that basically don't, do not have access to modern telescopes and had a very rudimentary understanding of the universe. And they had a ritual calendar, which overlaid on top of that 365 days to 260 days. It was not, however, as elaborate as the Maya calendar, but still being uh, pretty accurate for its time. We get the Mexica gods. We had, uh, I'm going to try that. Okay. Tzecapilipoca, the smoking mirror. Yeah, I'm going to call him that. On the right-hand side, the a more black figure. Uh, he was a powerful god of life and death. He was the patron god of warriors. So if you were a warrior, you probably would pray to him for a good battle. And then we have, uh, okay, here we go, Quetzalcoatl, uh, the feathered serpent. On the left, he was the god of arts, craft, architecture. And then we have one of my favorite people, Quetzalcoatl. Pochitlili. Yeah, uh, these names are insane. 14th century popularity. He was the patron of the Mexica, meaning he was the god of the Mexica, kind of like um, in the same way um, Athena was the patron goddess of Athens and Mars was the patron god of Sparta. The, the, both those cultures represented, uh, the gods represented what they valued or looked towards. Hitzblopochitlili. Uh, he, yeah, he was the patron saint of the Mexica. They would pray to him as being like their protector. There was an emphasis, however, on blood sacrifices as a result of his patronage. And that's where we get to the ritual bloodletting. There was more emphasis on human sacrifice than predecessor cultures. The Aztecs were known for their uh, violent use of uh, human sacrifice specifically. Now, not all sacrifices that were made as a result of human sacrifices were a person dying for the gods. Uh, there is one occasion in your book, it talks about how on the rededication of a temple, they had killed about 8,000 people as a result of that, but many sacrificial victims just had the tips of their fingers torn off before death. There were ritual wounds. Uh, for example, uh, eventually there would be, um, for example, these victims, the Mexican criminals or captured enemy soldiers would have like uh, their chests opened up with their hearts removed. 
Uh, we would have in the personal rituals the piercing of the foreskin of the penis, when which the blood would be spilt out onto pieces of some sort of parchment or paper or, or something that it would be collected and then put into a fire. Uh, then there was also the piercing of earlobes. Uh, there are pictures of uh, the the Mexica piercing their tongues to get the blood to flow. The idea was um, closely related to what we've talked about before with uh, blood as being kind of like the water of humans. And as the same way the land needs water, humans need blood. And by f making the uh, blood of a human flow and offering it to the gods, the gods would see the sacrifice as a a, a valuable expression of, uh, of honor to the gods and they would then continue making the crops grow and the sun shine and the birds sing and everything that the world needed as long as these uh, bloodletting rituals were performed. Yikes. Crazy picture. Peoples and societies of the north. So now we're going to move north of the Aztecs and the Mexica to a few groups. We have three specifically, the Pueblo and Navajo societies pictured in the top right with the lady and the baby. It was in the American Southwest. They did maize farming, or, or a very pre-early predecessor of uh, our modern-day corn, was 80% of their diet. Uh, by 700 CE, construction of permanent stone or adobe dwellings. There's 125 sites we've been able to discover in the American Southwest. Uh, then we go over to the Iroquois people, pictured down there at the bottom. Uh, they were known as a confederacy, as we would call them today. They were settled communities in the woodlands east of the Mississippi. There's the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Oneida, the Cayunga, the Seneca, and the Tuscarora. Uh, those were what we would call like American Indians, which is kind of a weird term to still use today. Indigenous peoples, Native Americans is very common. In Canada, many of the Native peoples are called First Nations, who were there before you know, the settlers, the European settlers that we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, then we get mound building peoples. We don't know a ton about them. We just know they built some pretty awesome dirt piles that are still seen as monumental for their time. Uh, they were ceremonial platforms. Some were homes. Some were burial grounds. It's near Chihoga Lake, mounted near mound. There's a big one near uh, East St. Louis, built somewhere between 900 to 1250 CE. Uh, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site for its uniqueness in that they move so much earth and kind of structured it in such a way. There's a picture here of a, a serpent mound near um, Ohio, and you can see it just has a very specific, and we're not 100% sure why they did it, but it's a very specific type of creation to the mound trade for all these people in uh, the Americas. There's no written documents that survive regarding northern cultures. Uh, the archaeological evidence indicates widespread trade, however, that we were able to find things that were in places from far away. Uh, river routes were probably exploited during this time. People would get into boats, row their boats, or go with the current, and they would take their trade up and down those rivers, specifically those like in the Mississippi uh, area, they would go up and down the Mississippi River. They would also go off into smaller uh, branches of the rivers, and uh, this is how they were able to trade during this time. However, we don't know a lot about what they did to trade. States and empires in South America are going to go now very far south. No writing before the arrival of the Spaniards in 16th century CE. Unlike the Mesoamerican cultures writing from the 5th centuries, okay, archaeological evidence reveals Andean society from the first millennium BCE, and there's a development of cities around 1000 to 1500 CE. So this culture had been going along for a pretty long time. Before the coming of the Incas, after the displacement of the Chavin, the Moche societies, there was a development of an autonomous regional states in the Andean South America. So, like we've talked about before, when there isn't a, a large, powerful, centralized government that's able to oversee a large area or even a regional area, uh, there would be a breakdown into autonomous regional states or smaller governments, either run as a part of a clan or run as part of a tribe or run as part of a um, communal group, and they would be uh, replacing those centralized or imperial or empire-like governments. We have the kingdom of Chuchito near Lake Titicaca, yes, border of Peru and Bolivia. They had potato cultivation. Now, potatoes are awesome. The thing I really love about potatoes are, uh, go back to our first chapter where we talked about calorie counts. Potatoes can be uh, mushed into kind of like a paste and saved for a very long time. They're very rich in calories and nutrients. If you think about it, you can uh, really chow down on a potato, but not too many of them. Whereas some of the people's, like if you've ever been to Chipotle, there's a, you know, that corn doesn't really fill you up if you don't have some of the other stuff on your plate in your or in your burrito. Uh, there was also the herding of llamas and alpacas. Those were probably uh, the largest 
mammals or largest uh, animals in the Western Hemisphere up until the arrival of the Europeans. We'll talk about that more when we get to, get to the uh, Columbian Exchange, but yeah, that would have been uh, one of the limiting factors for having really any kind of uh, carts or having any kind of uh, trade that would be able to move large amounts of goods. We then have the Kingdom of Chimu or Chimor. Uh, it's along the Peruvian coast, capital of Chan Chan. Next we get to the Inca Empire from the Valley of Cusco. It refers to the people who spoke Quechua language. There's a settlement around Lake Titicaca, mid-13th century. They had a ruler named Pachuchi. Uh, who ruled from 1438 to 1471. He is a expander of their territory, and it pretty much includes parts of modern Peru, parts of Ecuador, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina. So for being a culture that isn't really big on uh, the ability to move goods over a large amount of a large amount of goods over a large area for a group of people that pretty much reside in a very mountainous region of the world they're able to sustain their population to about 11.5 million and be able to keep the 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 continuity or the 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 power of the imperial state as a result of the inca empire uh, over parts of uh, what is today multiple countries. So that in suggests to us as uh, historians that these people were pretty much uh, really advanced for what we would consider uh, during this time compared to, say, uh, some of the no more North American groups that were more uh, smaller tribal and kin-based groups. Here's the Inca Empire. You can see how much it spreads. It's all that orangish-red uh, area. Now, as you look at this map, one of the things you're going to notice is it's very narrow along the western coast of South America. And you're going to say, okay, so they were able to maintain this empire. They were able to feed this empire. But it seems like that's a large amount of ground to cover, say, if something bad was happening somewhere or there was a need for supplies or goods or something going on. How did they do it? Well, we'll get to that in a little bit, but we're first going to look at the Inca administration and Kipu. The Incas ruled originally by holding hostages and colonization. Uh, when we talk about Japan, or I, I can't remember if we actually talked about it in Japan, the idea was you hold hostages and you basically say, the people are going to live with me in the main imperial empire, and in, in the main imperial city, and one of the things that will happen is if your people down in the south kind of get out of line, we might kill these people. We're going to treat them really nice, and we're going to make sure that everything's taken care of for them, but if y'all get out of line, we're probably going to end up killing them. So you, as a good villager, would make sure that your your tribal leader's wife doesn't get killed. You just keep doing what you got to do. There was also colonization, which they sent out uh, people where they would say, hey, you guys in this village, you now are under our protection as the Inca Empire, and we would uh, come fight bad guys for you, but we're also going to ask that you pay taxes and that you let us grow things here, and we kind of run your, your village now. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Uh, no writing, which is kind of complex for such a vast empire. But they did have something called kipu, which is a system of cords and knots called uh, kipu. Uh, if you look in the background, that's some kipu that we were able to find, and it was used as a mnemonic aid. Some of you know mnemonic aids as being useful in your studies of math or science or whatever. For example, you remember learning back in elementary school about uh, how to remember the directions as never eat shredded wheat or never eat soggy waffles for north out north west north east south west yeah that one or the mnemonic aid of pemdas please excuse my dear aunt sally for uh order of operations in math well this mnemonic aid works similar to that except for it was a physical thing here's how it would kind of work uh let's say you were a keeper of kipu on this corded knot, you would start on one end, and you would probably pick a colored strand that helped you to remember something. For example, let's say you picked orange, which represented uh, the number of people living in the first house outside your door or outside the temple. And as you were able to count from there, you would see that, okay, it's this long, so that means it's the male uh, or the dad, and then the second strand would be the wife, which has no uh, knot in it, and then the number of children for that house. And then as the colors changed, it would talk about maybe animals or maybe something uh, else that was Im of importance to your record keeping as a bureaucrat or a ruler. If you look very closely, like right there in the red box, you will see that some of them are shorter, representing something that we're not 100% sure on, but it had a very deep significance. And then there were also color changes, as for example over here by this purplish uh, blue black cord. Now, 
even though we can't read it, in the same way if I said to a kindergartner, you know, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally or PEMDAS, they don't have a clue what that, why that's important or why they need to know that information. It would be important to somebody who's studying the order of operations for math. Someone who looks at this kipu and has no idea what it represents might go, okay, it's a bunch of chords tied together. But to a person who is a bureaucrat, skilled in understanding what the kipu represented and meant, that would help them to administer their kingdom or their region or their empire or their tribe or whatever for the time being. Pretty unique and special. Then we get Cusco. Uh, it was the capital of the Inca Empire. Here's some ruins nearby it. Uh, the residents were high nobility, there were priests, those hostages I talked about. One of the interesting things is we know that they actually had gold facade on their buildings, which meant that outside of the bricks and the um, stones, they actually had figured out a way to cast gold. Uh, well, get, gold is relatively soft and be able to m kind of manipulate, but they were able to put it on the outside of their buildings that were of high importance. Pretty interesting. Inca roads. So we talked about before, how do you administer this giant empire? Well, the Inca were geniuses in that they built two roads. Here's what they did. They built a massive road building system, two north-south roads, approximately 10,000 miles. They had a mountain route and a coastal route. Here's why. Let's say you were fighting some people and they had blocked off uh, your ability to get your troops down to where they needed to be. Let's say you were up in hmm, Cusco and you needed to get uh, some troops down to Santiago. Well, you would probably want to be able to get a messenger from Santiago saying, help, we're being attacked by some tribes or something from Cusco. So you would send a messenger along the way on the coastal route. But if there was some way that was blocked or maybe it got washed out or something, you could also send them on the mountain route. And the mountain route could also have snow on it, so you might, you know, vice versa. Whatever the case being, but what was awesome about it was it was able to be, um, it was paved, it was shaded, it had wide roads for people to transverse on so they didn't just like fall off a cliff on the mountain roads. They had courier and messenger services. Here is how it worked. One courier would start somewhere and he would run, and he would run for a little while <coughs> until he got to the next um, space or rest house. He would then take that message, hand it off to another courier who had been resting all day and probably relaxing and, and just sleeping, and then once they get there, they wake him up and say, all right, man, your turn. Right, take this on down to the next station it needs to get to Cusco. That person would continue to run until they got to the next station and so on and so on. This guaranteed that there was the fastest, most efficient way to get messages up and down the vast, narrow empire without having to rely on one person who would need to rest, maybe need to have food on their back, which would slow them down, would need to um, have them camp or sleep for the night for those hours. This could move information very quickly up and down the coast or up and down the empire. They had limited long-distance trade held by government monopoly, so the trade was pretty much run by the government. There weren't really many traders, except for those kind of either authorized or a part of the government. Inca society and religion. Social elites dominated by an infallible king. Uh, this king was someone who could do no wrong. They were not to be overthrown. They were placed in um, the power by the gods uh, or the god. Uh, depending on how they looked at it. And for example, uh, we know that some of their uh, Inca rulers claimed direct descent from the sun or the sun god, and they had worship of ancestors. Their remains are preserved in mummified form, pretty uh, unique for this part of the world. Uh, regularly consulted their ancestors. There were sacrifices that were offered to their ancestors, and they prayed it on festive occasions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of weird to, to take old dead people and wander around with them, but... Uh, one of the nice things about it is that uh, you kind of remember those who have gone before you. Kind of an interesting way to look at it. Aristocrats, priests, and peasants. Aristocrats received special privileges, such as earlobe spools as a dormant. There was a priestly class, which was ascetic, meaning um, really, we've talked about this in the European uh, monks, where they were uh, not really flamboyant. They didn't have a lot of personal or worldly goods. And uh, they kind of spent a lot of time like praying by themselves or doing rituals by themselves. They were celibate, meaning they did not get married or have sex. Peasants organized into community groups called aliu. Uh, lands and tools were held communally, which is a very interesting idea for this time. Uh, the belief that the land is not my land, but our land to be worked on is a very unique idea in human history, and it doesn't really last for tons and tons of time because people are very, uh, in general, if you haven't noticed, kind of selfish and, and like to own things a lot. Mandatory work details on the land of aristocrats, and there was some public works where the people were taken off to go and work on uh, public roads, bridges, whatever it took pretty much to make the society work well. 
Inca religion. They have Inti, the sun god, uh, and Varakocha, the creator god. Uh, they had temples as pilgrimage sites. So you would actually go to those temples. You would offer some sort of veneration in the form of sacrifice to those gods. And then you would go home. And this was seen as a uh, religious duty or a valuable thing to do to praise the gods. Peasant sacrifices usually were produce and animals for this culture, not humans. So maybe you would bring like a cow or not a cow. You don't have cows yet. Uh, you would bring like a bunny or something small, like a, a gerbil, or a, a, I don't know, something smaller than cows. And you would bring them, and you would kill them on an altar, and then the gods would be happy. Or you would uh, take produce that you grew on your farm, and you'd throw it in the fire and offer that up to the gods. Sin was understood in this culture as a disruption of the divine order, meaning that there is a set of rules that the universe and the world plays by. And your... Um, sin would be anything that did not follow those pre-established rules so it's very different from something say as in the christian religion where um you could get in trouble for um saying words you were not supposed to ha or having thoughts about hurting someone well that those aren't really not a part of our normal world those things are just things that are specifically forbidden by the religion However, in the Inca religion, uh, sin would be seen as things like you uh, trying not to follow through with your obligation to society or not doing what you're supposed to do as a part of uh, the order of the universe and how it's set up. That's uh, Vera Chocha, the creator god. Societies of Oceania. So now we're going to jump over to the South Pacific Ocean, and we're going to look a little bit about this group. Um I've heard it pronounced Oceania, Oceania, Oceania. It, it doesn't really matter, just as long as you know what we're talking about. There were nomadic foragers of Australia. So these people wandered around, found what they could. Think uh, hunter-gatherer style. Virtually static culture because there was no agriculture. It's uh, pretty much in Australia not a very uh, vibrant uh, climate outside of the coast of Australia. The center of Australia is pretty much a giant desert. The coast of Australia is known as a kind of like an island paradise-y kind of feel to it. But they didn't really have agriculture for a pretty long time. Then we get to New Guinea, which is nearby. They had swine herding. I think like sort of pigs, but not really like our modern pig that we have today. They had root cultivation, some some tubular like root kind of um, plants around 5000 BCE. They had small scale trade of surplus food, some goods. Uh, pearly oyster shells, spears, boomerangs, which are kind of awesome. Uh, if you've never seen them, they look like this, what this guy is holding. It's a big curved piece of wood. And what's kind of awesome about a boomerang, and they figured out, is if you bend a piece of wood or find a piece of wood and carve it into a specific shape and you throw it a very specific way, you can get the uh, wood to fly away from you. And then at a certain point, it will actually catch the air and break back towards you. So let's say you were running after some sort of animal and or some like person and they were running away from you. You could throw this boomerang, hit them with it, and it wouldn't obviously fly back to you if it hit them. But let's say you missed, it would then come back to you and you'd have another thing or another chance to throw it at them. A uh, pretty interesting way to work out some kind of weapon. Cultural and religious tradition. Loosely tied with the environment. We're not 100% sure again on exactly how much they cared that much about the environment. There were myths, stories about geological features. For example, if you've seen the movie Moana, there's, there's stories about why is it that our island is here in the middle of the ocean, or how come there's like a giant like rock over there, or where did all the trees come from? And so they would have stories similar to the way we've learned about uh, mythological stories from other cultures. Rituals were in, used to ensure uh, continuing food supply. Uh, similar to a lot of religion that we've studied people believe that if the gods weren't happy the food would not continue to come so we have to make sure the gods are happy here are some of the societies of oceania we have the hawaiian islands the society islands the marquesas easter Island, samoa tonga fuji or fiji sorry new zealand australia new guinea philippines mariana marshall gilbert solomon the islands and you can see that this is a very large area with lots of little islands all over the place. And these groups of people probably ended up on them either walking and uh, over land through the like period we talked about at the very beginning of our course. Or getting in boats and kind of uh, traveling uh, from island to island. 
Development of Pacific Island Societies. Established in almost all islands in the early centuries BCE, there were trade between island groups. We know they got on boats and they actually traded between one another. Long distance voyaging was on an intermittent basis. It was very rare for them to just get on boats as a whole and just travel away from their original land, but there was that trade. Uh, they brought sweet potatoes from South America around 300 CE. So if you go back to our little picture, you can see where... Uh, some of those islands are and then if you just kept going around past where it says easter island eventually you would hit south america and what's nice about that is we know they made it there and came back with sweet potatoes around 300 ce way 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 before europeans got on boats and tried to go farther than that the voyages uh preserved in oral traditions uh through storytelling and different types of stories so that's how we know they happened population growth there was extensive cultivation uh, fishing innovations. This is a pretty brilliant idea. They would build fish ponds that allow small fish through and trap larger fish. So these fish ponds would be uh, built around the edges of beaches or they would be built by rivers. And as the fish would swim either through the um, the river or into like land from the ocean, what would happen is they'd set up these like traps made of sticks or some sort of like uh, hard kind of mesh fencing that they would create and the smaller fish would able to swim through and as the bigger fish kind of follow after them or go by they would get stuck up against the netting and you could just stand there and literally just stab one out of the water and then you have fish or you could just trap a bunch of them and use them like a fish farm eventually the population density leads to social strife when you don't have a lot of room and you have lots of people and you don't have a lot of like area for farming or spreading out it leads to people fighting there's an economic degradation as a result which eventually leads to fierce fighting and cannibalism or eating people around 1500 CE. Now, um, my co-teacher with this course uh, likes to make the joke about how there's a difference between let's eat grandma and let's eat grandma. Make sure you say the second one, not the first one. Development of social classes. Complexity of population leads to articulation of distinct classes. As societies get more uh, evolved in their progress towards um, what we would call a, a economic structure or social classes uh, they start to develop differentiation between who's at the top of the culture who is at the bottom of the culture who's in the middle why are they there are they noble do they have more stuff do they have a noble lineage like they're descended from the gods and really this starts to take place a little bit later than what we saw in europe but it's similar it takes a similar pattern for example there are high chiefs then there are lesser chiefs or nobles then there's commoners and then there's some artisans or craftspeople and then finally peasant farmers uh there were small multi-island empires that start to form uh so in normal areas we would see like a empire form in like near the center of some sort of culture and then they would dominate outward from there into the rural areas in this case because there's just ocean many of these islands form little uh groupings of empires through this process it was limited before the 19th century, yet controlled land allocation, labor, and military conscription. So labor was controlled by these centralized powers, military uh, groupings were controlled by these centralized powers, and they can be conscripted or forced into working or being a part of the military as a result of being part of these empires. The Polynesian religion. There were priests as intermediaries to the vine. We've seen this before. Priests are kind of the people you talk to, and then they go and talk to the gods, and then they come back with an answer about what the gods want us to do or how they want us to do it or whatever. The god, There were gods of war and agriculture that were the most prominent. Uh, this was seen as uh, placating the gods that we'd seen in previous chapters. And there was a ceremonial precinct or temple known as Mare or Hiau in Hawaiian. Now, um, there's a very famous example of kind of like an ancestor style uh, ritual that comes to us from this area of the world. It's seen pretty much every week in uh, different forms and specifically with uh, rugby. So I thought I'd show you some of these um, kind of ancestor venerating type of dances and you'll see for this in an example. Leading tonight's haka will be Captain Tim Bateman because Pitiwipu, who would normally have led it, He's gone home with an injury. Captain Tim Bateman will lead it, and he'll actually have, for the first time, a green stone called the Modi. And we'll listen up as it happens now.
so that's absolutely terrifying if you were to see that before a uh, battle with a uh, tribe of Maori. Specifically, this uh, thing is called, uh, or the Haku, excuse me, the Haku from um, the people of New Zealand. And we made it. Uh, when you finish studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. First, compare and contrast the political development of states and empires in post-classical Mesoamerica. Second, identify and compare the peoples and societies of the North. There were three of them. Uh, third, identify important features of Mexica society and religion. Four, identify, explain the rise and development of the Inca Empire. Easy. Five, explain the features of Mexica religion and identify prominent deities. Six, discuss the key characteristics of Inca society and religion. Seven, explain the development and features of nomadic societies in Australia. And eight, identify and discuss key features of Pacific Island societies. Here's your questions. Writing assignment, write a short response, five to eight sentences to the following questions using these episodes of your class. Number one, why the peoples of North America not achieve the population density of the societies of Mesoamerica? There's some key reasons, and it kind of goes back to some of the really big truths of world history of why Mesoamerica didn't uh, or was able to grow to larger uh, a larger scale than the Northern American counterparts. Number two, what aspects of Mexican society made them vulnerable to attack with the arrival of the Spanish in the 16th century? What do you see as a big problem in the way their society is structured that made the Spanish Europeans able to conquer them? And third, compare the Aztec and Inca societies with those of the Pacific Islands. What were the similarities? What were the significant differences? So that's like a Venn diagram, make two circles. What's the Inca and Aztec on one? Uh, the Pacific Island societies on the other side. What were the similarities? What were the significant differences? Easy peasy. As always, it has been nice talking to you. It is time to get out that book and reread. I hope this has been helpful to you. We will see you soon. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.